Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a big pleasure to host today with us Jane Berry. Um, Jane, first of all, is a very, very good friend. She, she just cooked for us like a week ago back when we were in Melbourne. Um, for the ones that you don't know, uh, Jane is an architect. She's more like an experimental architect, I would say. She's that kind of architect that is trying to combine research with design, education and practice, combining uh, um, everything related, uh, the digital and the prototyping. So a lot of the work that she will be sharing with us today um, is, is also an opportunity for all of us to start to see how we can can combine disciplines, but also how we can really uh, think architecture from different set of data that it is uh, involving our architecture and environment. She is the Dean of the um, Design at the Swinburne University of Technology, a great and new challenge for her after being a lot of years at the RMIT, uh, running the special architectural lab special information architecture laboratory uh, with a great project and research there and uh, Jane is also collaborating with us in a way together also with uh, Mark Berry and at Swinburne University of Technology um, uh, we are working together in order to see how we can do projects research how we can uh, join powers for the project of the city and technology next year in Melbourne but also for PhD work and um, and and uh, more exciting uh, collaborations among us. So um, no more to say. Just to thank you very much, Jane, for being here with us today. Looking forward for your talk, and please help me welcome Jane Berry. So thank you very much for that introduction, Nareti. I'm just going to poke that in and see what happens. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of empty seats down here if anybody at the back wants to come down and make this more intimate and kind of communicative. It's lovely and warm and, um, and it's sort of friendly and warm as well. Um, so I'm just... Okay. having a little sleep. Anyway, I'll just use this as an excuse while you guys come down and while the projector sort of comes, uh, wakes up again, um, just to um, say I've really, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks for the um, invitation to be here. I've been really looking forward to this talk and I'm sorry it's a little bit croaky, um, but I've just spent a week in Hong Kong in continuous air conditioning and this is what it does to you. Honestly. And, and this will come up again during the talk, which is, is why I raise this. And then a day in London yesterday um, when almost all the flights were cancelled except mine which did actually fly very late at night and um, eventually arrived here about 4.30 in the morning. Um, so I'm going to talk about design dynamics and I put just sort of thinking about dynamics and this probably should be a video but um, if you look at this image of a mountain in Tasmania with these clouds kind of roiling over the top of it, coming and going, you can at least imagine um, these cloud formations uh, um, appearing and disappearing um, in this environment. And I think uh, as, as architects and designers, we think particularly of architecture as this very sort of solid matrix of which the built environment is made. Um, and I think, but I think one of the things that's happening, and I know it's happening here in EAC, and it's certainly been happening in our group, is we're thinking a lot more and a lot more deeply about those interactions between that very solid stuff and the very, very dynamic stuff, um, particularly the atmosphere. So I thought I'd just give you that image because it is quite a cool image. Okay, so back to my travel story. Before I left, even left Melbourne Airport, um, as I was going along, I came upon these pan painted panda sculptures. 
And I thought that's kind of interesting because about 10 years ago, everybody was writing about airports and talking about them as the no place, but the place that we were starting to live in a lot. So you see this air conditioning theme just keeps coming up again and again. Um, but um, the fact that we had all got very mobile meant that we were spending more of our times in these kind of in-between no spaces. And I thought it was interesting to see this exhibition. I, unfortunately, I didn't take the photo at the right angle. There are about 25 of these pandas with their um, bamboo behind them. Um, so somebody is trying to make the airport a place. So it's sort of interesting, this kind of, again, a sort of dynamic between the no place and the place. And now the airport becomes this kind of urban space in which we do public art. Of course, I got very curious because you would think about, you guys would probably think about this too. You think, well, you don't just mass produce a whole lot of pan pandas like that. Um, you, you have to make them and there's a lot of care in that and in the paint, in the amazing paint finishes and the geometry of the pandas. So I was kind of curious about who was doing that and I thought about our friends in Melbourne, Special Patterns, which is a, probably one of the most advanced um, robotic uh, manufacturers down in the southeast of Melbourne. So you may or may not know that Melbourne used to be a car manufacturing um, place. In fact, it used to be a manufacturing centre of all sorts of things. Um, and we're now, in terms of cars, we're just a research and development and design centre. So Ford is still there in that capacity. But there was a sort of massive ancillary industry and very important for design around the auto industry. Special Patterns is a great example of that. These were pattern makers originally. They also have real a lot of expertise in specialist robotics for, for just about everything. And they've had to turn away from the auto industry, although they still do some special stuff um, for them, towards architecture and public art. And that, that's a very sort of common story across the industry at the moment. So then I was in the plane, air conditioning again, um, and uh, it was a day flight, which was great, so I sort of got to see things like this, you know, the, see Australia the way you can only see it from the plane. I wasn't product placement, by the way. Um, and then about nine and a half hours later, you come into Hong Kong, and already, you know, through the atmosphere you, and, and the way you see this, you understand the difference between these places. I got out of the plane into the airport and saw these huge signs for the thing I was going to, which is Building of Design Week um, at, in Hong Kong. And this is an amazing kind of party as only Hong Kong can throw for about 100,000 people. It's a kind of matchmaking exercise between young designers, buyers, um, and also a great many um, very erudite speakers. So I know that um, Geordie Fowley is in the audience here and everybody was m remembering Geordie's presentation on the Sagrada Familia a few years ago. Um, this year it was Italy makes a difference, so there were a lot of Italian speakers. I just got to the hotel, I had 10 minutes um, to go and quickly have a shower and get changed and get in an air-conditioned car and go to an air-conditioned dinner and on the way, the dinner was hosted by someone called Victor Lowe, who's the chairperson of this entire huge event in Hong Kong. We went to KEF, or KEF, K -E -F, um, which is this very specialist speaker company and these are Ross Lug Lovegrove designed speakers that we're looking at here and have this extraordinary sonic experience of being in a space. I mean, I, I really love the IMAX. This was like the IMAX in a small space, sort of a whole cine cinematographic sound and, and classical music and, um, and it didn't matter how much you turned up the volume in this small Conran designed interior, you still got no distortion from these speakers. But isn't it, isn't it funny? I cannot convey that experience at all except in words. So I think this, the point about this is the way that we're still so ocular centric in the way that we think about phenomena um, and try to describe them. So of course I did record some of it on my phone but it would be completely useless without the Ross Lovegrove speakers to try and play that experience back. And then this is the one little bit of outside um, air um, while catching a taxi, and I, I, um, this is this has not been manipulated at all. This is just the Hong Kong street at night, and I thought the, the amazing kind of superposition of this image um, on the street scene is sort of ex it sort of somehow typifies where we're at at the moment in this kind of space between virtual 
um, highly manipulated imagery and, and what's left of the solidity of the city behind. So what am I going to talk about here? You might think I'm rambling a little bit about my, my journey. I sort of thought about this as, a, as three themes, um, and we'll see if I get through all three of them, watching the time disappearing. Um, so first of all, I'll just talk a little bit of history of my own kind of preoccupations in transdisciplinary design research. Areti, in her introduction, mentioned that we've worked across the disciplines now um, very actively for, for quite a few years. and. Um, those can be sort of generalized into mathematics and geometry in architecture, of which I'll talk more. Um, Real-time analysis feedback into design, and um, particularly the sort of dynamic side of that and intuitive side of that. And the thing that, that for you and for us underpins all of this activity is, is prototyping. I'm going to talk about three projects, talk about one reasonably briefly, um, which is looking at capturing the dynamics of air. Uh, one I'll talk a little bit more about, which is the um, sound of space, we're calling that one. So using physical architecture and design to manipulate qualities of sound in space. And very briefly, I'll just talk about some very current work looking at much larger scale data collection and how we can bring that back into design. And then, because I've just moved occupation and just moved into the dean role at Swinburne and thinking about things at another scale in terms of education, if I have enough time at the end, I'll, I'll give you three thoughts on the future of design education. Um, so starting with this one, so always back to Barcelona, everything starts in Barcelona, that's why we all come here I guess. Um, I did promise Mark that I will hardly talk about the Sagrada Familia because I know that he's running a, a column project here in EAC and I'm sure he gives lots of lectures on this topic. But I have to just give a sort of little personal um, talk about the way this affected my thinking um, around space and design. Um, this is the, uh, as you'll know, the colonnade on the west transept which is variously described as the stretched ribcage of Christ or the entry to the, the dragon, something to do with the dragon and the bones around St. George. Um, it's very, this very sort of emotive sculptural piece. Um, I got sort of drawn into um, involvement in the Sagrada Familia around the turn of the 2000s when Mark was working on the window behind this in the, the Rosassa and, um, and it was quite a fast track process. It was a sort of 13 month process from, from first measurements and parametric modeling to having the whole thing constructed. And it involved, part of that process involved 780 A0 trays to be sent to the stonemason down in Galicia. Um, and that was a very, uh, for me, I was a little under, underemployed at the time, and that was a very enjoyable process, working with a whole lot of productivity routines for, for translating parametric model into solid model into, and then automating the, the um, sort of spitting out in the three cardinal directions of the, these huge one-to-one -one trays for the stonemason. I haven't, haven't actually included the images for that, but that's, that's, and then very, very fortunate had the opportunity to work on this colonnade and its design. And this was one of the parts of the church, unlike the nave, where there were no, um, no original Gaudi models, nothing that had been put um, back together again after all the damage during the Civil War. Um, this was actually the model we had to work from, was a photograph, 1917 photograph of a drawing, and a very emotive drawing, the sort of deep shadows and um, gouache and mixed media drawing. Um, and we also had a, a, a a uh, plaster model, an earlier plaster model, but um, that had somehow gone away, a little away from this drawing. So the aim was to get back to that drawing and try and um, analyze the geometry in there, do a little bit, a bit of reverse engineering. 
um, ultimately to build this very large parametric model. And this is really the point of my thing, was the experience of this model, uh, other parametric models, but particularly this one, because it was very large and it had a very long life. Luckily, we had the luxury of working with Katia, which is obviously for building models of ships and, and um, virtual cars, so it can handle very large models very easily um, and divide those in ways that allows it to be very precise and very accurate. But the model, in the end, had thousands of interdependent parameters in it, so you could change one surface somewhere and that change would ripple right through. There's no um, repeats in there. Every single piece of geometry is unique. There's no mirror symmetry or every column is, is different, all the surfaces are different. And working in that space, I thought, isn't it funny that as, as architects and designers, we're very concerned with things which are very concrete in the world, things that we can visualize and that we conceptually think of as three-dimensional. And here we are working in these huge computational models where we can spit out an instance and have a look at something, but we can never see or visualize the model in all its complexity. And we just sort of know when it breaks and we know that sometimes we have to build in reactions into it. So you, you, can't, you can't model it top down. You have to say, if this bit goes wrong, you know, try this, if that. Um, and uh, so isn't that sort of curious that we're working in this very different, very mathematical space? I wonder who has worked on visualizing that before. So that led me into a PhD, which is called Logic and Intuition in Architectural Modeling, Philosophy of Mathematics for Computational Design, looking at the sort of work of mathematicians and, um, and philosophers of mathematics. At the same time, we started to think about how constraining it was even to work with parametric modeling because it's so hierarchical. Um, so we did a project um, called Challenging the Inflexibility of the Flexible Model. And we also worked on this book, The New Mathematics of Architecture, um, which was kind of thinking, if you've got this fantastic cerebral annex of the computer, what difference does that make to architects? We had all we had modernism in the 20th century. It was an incredible kind of return to very constrained geometrical approach to geometry, um, of really constructing geometry. Um, interfaces had, had that given to architects and had it meant that they could actually now um, much more easily take up post Descartian, post 17th century mathematics. So we just looked at a few topics here um, that were obviously things that architects were interested in like topology, surface and seriality, um, packing and tiling and so on. And it wasn't... It oh thank you, thanks. How's that? Was that terrible at the back? You didn't. You were so quiet and polite. Um, so um, it, it's not like this was a completely new idea in design. I think this is a fabulous example of that. This is the tube map in London from 1908, and this is what it looked like um, post Beck in the in the early 1930s. So um, this one is completely uh, geographically accurate over the city plan. This one is completely topological and bears no resemblance to the distances. So that's somebody who understood completely the point of Euler's mathematics and the seven bridges of Königsberg and could translate that into something that we still effectively use um, today, understand very well, and has become almost a, not only an amazing navigational device, but a branding that's endured for 80 years so far. So in terms of an example, I thought rather than giving one from the book, I'll talk about something, a, a sort of relatively recent project. This here is a building node from a building structure. Um, that will allow, um, it's been optimized um, and geometrically it allows three members to come together at any sort of random angles to one another. It's been created using something called bidirectional evolutionary structural optimization and, and many and people in here who use grasshopper and rhino might be familiar with millipede which is a kind of um, accessible version of a similar kind of optimization approach. So for anybody who's not familiar with that, um, basically you take a blob of stuff, you impose some loads on that, 
you do the analysis and you find out which is the least stressed material and you take away 1% or 10% of that, you see what you've got left and then you repeat that process maybe 100 times iteratively. And um, because this is called bi-directional structural optimization, that means it actually works both ways. It's a little bit like bone growth. Not only does it take away the bits you don't need, it can actually add material where you need more. So the, the, the brilliance of this idea was that an awful lot of the weight of, of structures is in the nodes. Um, so if you can really highly optimize the nodes and take away that weight, you reduce the weight of the whole structure, you reduce the foundations, and that's a very sustainable thing to do. Um, the other beauty of it is every node in the structure would be unique on this basis. Um, and these were printed on an SLM machine um, in titanium, the ones we're looking at. So here's a four node, here's a five node, this one's plastic, clearly, at scale. Um, so this was, and this allows you um, to build very freeform structures as well because you can accommodate all these different directions. Um, this was a problem that Arup had been working on at the, the Singapore Stadium roof and we're very interested in. At the time, we got involved with something called the Independence Group. The Independence Group was an idea for enlisting young practitioners. In this case, you can see Christoph Kroller, very tall, dis um, distinctively tall fellow standing in the background, who is um, the lead architect in LEED in Hong Kong. So we had applications from young architects who wanted to work with leading consultants like Arup. In this case, we match, ma um, match made um, this partnership with LEED and Arup. Arup were very keen to explore this node question and were already doing that in their office in Amsterdam. So we had a sort of playoff between Melbourne and Amsterdam. And this is a, this is a, a scale pavilion that was built at um, architects Sorry, Engineers Australia in Melbourne. Um, so, yeah, you can read that. Um, so that's the sort of that's partly the that's the gym a little bit of the taste of the geometrical story. That's also obviously something about feedback in design and using feedback in design, but. Um, sort of earlier on this decade, we suddenly decided that actually you could do quite a lot in terms of feedback between structure and, and geometry, um, parametrically, and people were doing a lot of work on that. But maybe the next sort of really hard thing to look at would be aero and thermodynamics, something where you really would be forced to work very closely um, as architects and designers with mathematicians and aerospace engineers, for instance. So um, this was a project called Designing the Dynamic, which um, involved looking at all the dynamics of air and water in sailing and taking a whole group of people, uh, architects, designers, uh, industrial designers, sailors, sail designers, mathematicians, engineers together, about 50 people worked on that. And that, that led to this book, which I won't talk about in any detail, but yeah, you can still get hold of it and buy it. it. It's got one of those problems about where to sit on the shelf, because it's sort of a little bit about sailing, a little bit, a bit about feedback in, um, in architecture. And both those groups of people kind of like it, but um, uh, anyway. So that's led on to a lot of what's gone subsequently. And then um, this other story was about prototyping. And again, it was a similar sort of question to the question around the maths was, isn't it interesting that now that we're sort of post-digital and we've got all this computational capacity, isn't it interesting that architects and designers seem to be actually it, it seems to have proliferated their use of physical prototyping in all sorts of interesting ways and mixed reality prototyping. So it was kind of doing a bit of a review of, of what's been happening in that space. So now I'll, I'll just talk about some projects in a bit more uh, depth. So this is a project that came out of a couple of previous projects and also out of the designing the dynamic, that sort of initial experiment, which is called 
And we've got a little bit of funding to look at integrating architectural, mathematical and computing knowledge to capture the dynamics of air. And that's been a whole sort of series of very of smaller projects over um, a series of years. So this is um, this was a, a smart geometry project uh, in 2016 in Sweden last year. Um, and I thinking that I might I might just dare to play a bit of video and turn the sound off behind that. No, it's very dangerous if I turn the sound off so I can talk over this. It's very likely it won't come on again for the other videos, but I'm going to take the chance. Um, so I'll just play this video because it kind of, t t although it's just one project of, uh, among a lot, it kind of typifies the work that we were doing in this project, which is, in this case, building a, a large wall of cells. Each cell has its own unique little bundle of sensors in there, uh, which will do proximity, pressure, temperature, humidity, um, and probably other things that I've forgotten. Um, they've all got their own address, so um, you can sort of monitor what's going on there. And then getting a group of people to build very unique um, material and uh, structural cell uh, infills for those cells and looking at how just having people walking past, having activities happening in proximity to that wall, how it starts to change the map of the climate across the wall. And then the, the smarts in this one were to introduce a bit of augmented reality so that um, not only was this sort of mapping back onto the computer, but that in real time you could walk with your phone and see how you were impacting on the, on the microclimate around this wall. So I'm getting there faster than the video. But she's going to show us the app now on the augmented reality app on the phone, I think, which will hopefully make everything clear. Maybe for the next one. Hmm. a bit of a history to this. This was a much simpler experiment which was a, few, a couple of years earlier, thermal reticulations which we also tried out at Smart Geometry, uh, where we just put a heat lamp in front of um, a, a box of sensors with a facade model on the front of that box and looked at the way heat travelled differently through the different um, designs of these kind of nominal facade models through the box behind. And the, the differences were quite, quite radical and, and particularly um, we found, you know, if there's something directional about your, your relief pattern and you just change that by 90 degrees, that totally changed the dynamics of the heat trans, um, transport within the box behind. And we also sort of looked at the surface with the thermal camera. Um, and what that told us was that convection 
was a huge factor in that. But what it allowed people to sort of iterate again with their design and build this kind of intuition around what was what was happening here. Again, it's this idea of this very early feedback in very early design. And through this project, uh, there are a lot of other. Um, a lot of other tools were built. So this is Robo Thermodon, also known as Steve, which is an artificial sun built on the robot. Um, so the advantage is it's, it's like a heliodon in a sense. So you can emulate the sun moving around the sky at any time in any location. But the beautiful thing about Steve is that if he's not calibrated quite right, so if you m map a sun path and the robot follows it and the um, radiance and the heat on the surface isn't quite right, you can sort of reverse calibrate that and, and Steve can take a tra slightly different track. So you could get a very sort of precise readings and there was a fair amount of care taken to make sure that the lamps that were used were going to produce the heat and light that was needed for that. So Mirnosh Latifi took this in another direction. She did a whole lot of experiments on different facade designs and, and then taught herself slip casting from some uh, artisans in um, Iran, where she's from, and then made very these three-dimensional optimized tiles that allow air to flow through. They're also hollow, so they can contain water or phase change materials, and then um, uh, really have a very big impact on the climate. It's very hard to see this stuff, which is what we discovered. So we knew that convection currents are having a huge impact on the way surfaces behave and the way they, they transmit heat through them as well as across them. But to see that is very difficult, and it's very difficult in um, CFD to model that. Um, so here we're looking at tiles of different glazing, different qualities, and looking at Schlier and photography, which is a way of actually looking optically at the way um, heat and currents will change the density of air and being able to pick that up through, an, through actually a very traditional scientific photography technique. And then a series of mini wind tunnels um, built by the group, Rafael Moya Castro in particular. Um, and looking at the way if you manipulate the shape very carefully, you can create air vaults in public space. So really you could put up very, very low barriers in a street where you've got a wind problem. We have a lot of wind problems in Melbourne, increasing as our, with our increasing density. Um, you could put very low barriers up, and if you're very uh, clever about their sculptural qualities, you can make a very large wind vault to protect people. And then comparing uh, human experience, so physiological um, qualities, your sweat, your temperature, your um, heart rate, etc., with ambient qualities of space. So this is, uh, Daniel Prohaski is leading this research and related to his PhD, putting together collections of, of sensors. This was a trip around the Casa Bio, again, Barcelona always features greatly, um, comparing different people's journeys around that incredible environmentally designed space and increasingly sophisticated tools to do that. So he, we know what we see. We know the visual frequency range that we see very accurately. We know what we hear. Um, we know we hear from 20 to 20,000 hertz. What we don't know so much about is actually what we feel. We know we need to feel air movement all the time. We know that it feels very different to be in a very sort of chaotic air environment to one that's relatively periodic and regular. Um, so a lot of experience experimentation to look at what that means and how that might impact on design. So this is a sound of space that I'm going to talk about for a little bit longer. This comes back to the Sagrada Familia again. 2010, the Pope came to um, consecrate the space. And for the first time, that big space was not full of scaffolding. But, but you'll know this space very well, and you know that there's a choir 
spaces all the way around. They were full of choristers and musicians. And those musicians reported that that space is incredibly diffuse as a sound space. That was actually very surprising to us because it's all hard surfaces. It's very, very resonant. It has a maximum resonant frequency of, of um, uh, uh, maximum reverberation time, sorry, of 12 seconds. Um, it's got all these columns and hard, irregular objects in the space. So you would expect sort of hot spots and cold spots, but that was not so. Actually, you can place people all around the church and the sound is very even around the space. So we became very curious about the scattering possibilities of Gaudi's hyperbolic surfaces and found there was very little research, although Mark did find one reference in Puchibawada to the fact that he knew that this was the case. So we did some fairly fundamental research uh, and, and teamed up with Brady Peters, who's now at the University of Toronto, and looked at how these surfaces uh, might be affecting sound. We tried to replicate some of those amazing techniques that I know you've been working on in here as well and found out how difficult it is to actually mix good plaster. Um, we used a zinc template and spun that to make a hyperboloid and then cast bricks onto that with hyperboloid surfaces and built those into a rather crude um, cylindrical wall, a cylinder being the worst shape you could get for focusing sound, and then compared that to a smooth cylinder of the same radius. If you stood in front of the smooth cylinder and spoke to it, it shouted back at you, but if you stood in front of the hyperboloids, um, it, it completely scattered and diffused the sound and you didn't get that effect at all. But then there's some more serious sort of computing and going on down here with people subtracting hyperboloids from these uh, discs that you can see down there um, in order to do some uh, scale acoustic experiments. And fortunately, we were we had access to the diffusion chamber that was used for the Copenhagen Opera House through DTU, who were also partners on this through Brady Peters. So a lot of time was spent testing these discs um, with very special microphones and speakers to uncover the range of frequencies over which each of these discs scatters the sound. And you can see there's a very clear win winner in orange there, which was a design called Dolomites um, by Giovanni Betty, who was at Foster's. Um, and it has a lot of variation of depth and size of hyperboloid across the surface. And as intuitively might expect, it was doing some very good scattering. So th the overall finding from that was that hyperboloids indeed are great surfaces for sound scattering. At the same time, um, Sile uh, at RMIT was moving into the design hub building, a new building, and uh, very open plan spaces and very little opportunity for private meetings. So the project services were going to place some of these off-the-shelf um, air pods in there and we had an opportunity to say, no, no, give the money to us and we will use it very profitably for research. Um, because we already know that hyperboloids are the key to um, making a beautiful quality of sound. So we can make you a pod that will have um, an exquisite internal acoustic, will not have to be enclosed, will not have to have its own air conditioning or electricity supply, will be open to the air but will have the same um, trans transmission, sound transmission stopping qualities that your enclosed glass pod would have. So that was quite a big claim and then quite a challenge to, to meet that. We found out that if you use the same hyperboloid um, and uh, in a Voronoi pattern, across the surface. If it's on a plane or if it's on a sphere, you get planar intersections between those hyperboloids, which is awfully useful for building bricks. And almost any other instance you don't, you get um, a, a three-dimensional result that's very hard to build. And then we tried out all sorts of different options with in combining spherical surfaces um, and brought to bear a whole uh, group of practitioners and students around that problem. Um, and, and 
but also did a lot of, had Brady over from Toronto to Australia um, to help us get going on a lot of uh, simulation work to look at the best sound producing shapes and this was the winner. We tested some of the cells for the sound transmission down in a t sound testing lab in the basement at RMIT. And then built these 180 unique Voronoi cells. Um, then there's a whole story behind that in terms of the digital fabrication aspects. Um, very fortunately, we had attracted someone called Nick Williams from um, design to production. And uh, so with Swiss, kind of exacting Swiss standards for precision in construction. And he worked with someone called John Cherry, uh, who's also um, very good at that sort of thing at RMIT. So there were three different material systems. Uh, one of these is PET felt from recycled drink bottles and acoustic felt, very absorbent. I don't think it had ever been formed like that to that depth before, so they were keen to sponsor us. Um, acrylic and a spun aluminium, uh, which was also sponsored for that beautiful yellow anodizing. Um, the precision was good, so the cells went together in, um, with, I think, John and Nick and four students over a period of about three days, fully wired and connected. Um, and, and it is, I think people are actually very fond of that space. Um, we've, we had the luxury of having it for two or three years to continue to experiment on it afterwards, so it's a sort of permanent prototype in the space. Um, and it, it does have a very, very nice, diffuse, very clear, you feel incredible speech clarity within there. So we theorize that if people are in a space and they have incredible speech clarity, um, then they will probably subconsciously lower their vocal effort, make less noise, and that will really help not to spread the sound around the space. Um, then we uh, moved on to do these experiments, and here is an experiment with um, subjects sitting inside, participants sitting inside the pod, participants sitting outside, doing a lot of um, perceptual testing against actual measurements of sound, and you can see the orange is perceptions, the blue is the sound. So again, people are not that accurate in what they think is going on in terms of um, the sound they're hearing and the privacy, but... Um, and then a second experiment comparing that pod to a pod of exactly the same volume, which is really important for sound, but a, a much more anechoic type of um, sound environment and one that can be enclosed. And actually what we found was very curious. Um, this was Pantia Alambegi's PhD, so she's leading the research on this. We found that quite counterintuitively, People's eyes are much more powerful in their subconscious tendency to vocal effort and the sound that they make than their ears. So if, if they were sitting in a space and it looked open, they can see it's open to the ceiling, like in here, subconsciously we think that the sound is escaping and we actually up the volume of our speech. If we're in an enclosed space and it looks completely enclosed, we will subconsciously drop the vocal effort. Um, so that was really surprising to us, um, but it was very consistent um, and, um, and sort of undeniable. And the funny thing was that it was kind of the opposite to what people thought was happening um, perceptually. Um, so Panty has also done a lot of s s a simulation, just looking at different polygons, looking at going back to basics and just looking at shapes. Um, blue means good, red means bad, so incredible differences. And the scale that she's looking at this is right between sort of 50 and 70 in the space. Uh, and STI is an acoustic measure, which is really a very good measure of um, intelligibility, whether you can actually, whether you've got privacy or not, whether you're hearing sound in a way that you're understanding what you're hearing, and that would be disturbing to you. So, so being able to reapply that, some of the principles that she's coming up with in designing FabPod 2, 
Um, so one of the one of the aspects is that it's concave on the inside and on the outside. Um, and then we've kept that sort of cellular approach, uh, so the cells will be um, unique again, but linking those two surfaces with, with single cells. The idea is to move away from all the craft that was involved in FabPod 1 towards something much more manufacturable. So in this case, rather than MDF, which was the, the carcass of those cells in the first one, and required a huge amount of training and special jigs to, to get the precision that was needed, this is uh, folded sheet metal. So once these are folded and riveted, um, basically they're within tolerance um, and very, 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 that sort of accuracy is almost automatic. You could have a very unskilled labor force doing this, and it's speedy. Um, so here's the first prototype that was built at Grimshaw offices um, in Melbourne, the architect of the frame. Um, the other bit of sort of manufacturing smarts was an idea about having unique oculi or openings in this structure that could all be f made from forming one single um, cone shape. So it's an ABS cone that's been repeated over one mould, uh, manufactured very cheaply because it is just a single mould. Um, but a little, little bit of interesting mathematics around that. So uh, looking at the unique shapes of these openings and then mapping the curve mapping those shapes back onto a cone and finding the perimeter of that such that when you, fl when you um, deform the ABS cone back onto a plane, um, you get those unique shapes. Um, so it's all based on conical geometry. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I'm not doing all that well for time, so I probably shouldn't play this. But, um, so uh, we're about to sort of publish on this some of the trials and tribulations and challenges of getting this very accurate robot cutting working properly and being able to again use the same base or mold repeatedly to do that. So this is actually down at Special Patterns inside their factory. They very kindly helped us out with some additional robotic facilities down there. I've been quite um, keen to support the project. Which is still work in progress. So uh, watch this space. Hopefully we'll have the same opportunity to do uh, to do iterative research subsequently and make some more acoustic discoveries through building this prototype. Swarming, I'm not going to say much about that, that's very much work in progress, but it's an opportunity to look with Oricon engineers and Flight Data Australia as our partners to look at um, gathering data on a much bigger scale and combining aerospace computer science to do that but bringing the d looking at ways to bring the data back into urban design and architecture so i have got actually 30 seconds technically but i'm hoping could i have another 5 minutes okay great um so everything changed for me this year because I moved to university. Change is good. It's always very good to do that. Um, but it means a much greater preoccupation with a much bigger group of people and a much larger um, part of the organization. So I thought I'd talk a little bit very quickly about Swinburne, what we're doing. Um, it's a University of Technology. And it's a very uh, strong, there's a very strong culture of interdisciplinary working. In fact, the way the degrees are structured, there's a lot of opportunity for the students there to curate their own degrees and to bring some sort of minor, uh, minors in with their majors. And so, for, for instance, when we start the new architecture degree that, uh, this coming year, um, you'll be able to be an architect that specializes in business or um, 
digital media design or an, uh, you know any number of miners that you might choose to integrate in there. We've got a strategic plan for 2025, which is future ready learners, research with impact and innovative enterprise. In the backdrop there you can see Melbourne, CBD, uh, which is just at the moment in the last year going from about 30 to 50 stories up to about 80 stories uh, and in a very dense kind of way and in a way that as far as I can tell doesn't conform to any of the fantastic planning codes that I see in place in places like Hong Kong and Shenzhen. So um, you know there's no problem with putting a second bedroom in, a, in an unlit, unwindowed space. So back to my story about air conditioning, we, we're sort of certainly building in a way that we're going to be dependent for a very long time on powered airflow in those buildings. So some quick thoughts on, on uh, what's happening and how that impacts on education. The professions are undergoing disruption and change, so I think really at the moment there's no room for complacency around that. It's something we really have to think about. Because if we're really protective of our professions as they are, we find that our design tasks are automated. If I'd had a bit more time, I was going to talk about that in a little bit more detail, but I think you guys are probably very onto that already in the ways in which that can happen. I mean, I have just in recent times seen an AI app that can do what we would, d at the speed that we were working with the topological optimization, it can optimize layouts for multi-residential buildings, code check, and look at the daylighting in those, um, and give you a score out, and then do another one. So I, it's very difficult to see how, um, for a large developer, how they would think that a, a human would be better engaged in that part of the process, at least, for planning multi-residential. So that's just an example. Um, you know, we're going to apps rather than services and bricks and mortar. And what that means, I think, for, for design education is we really need to stay en engaged and enfolded with industry, community and government. Something that you guys are very good at and something that we're also working really hard at sort of throughout the courses that we're running and the research. We need to learn from other disciplines and we've also, very importantly, got to bring design into other disciplines. So that dreaded term, design thinking, nevertheless it's got us inside through all sorts of doors and into all sorts of organisations um, and that's very significant. It's not just significant for the employment of designers but it's very significant for a sort of shift in a way of thinking of a whole community. Um, and we've got to pathway our students into employment and enterprise, so that's sort of back to really involving ourselves with industry and everything we do. Um, we need to draw a wide range of learners into design education um, and also stay out there in the public um, and keep the debate going in a public space, something that we certainly need to put lots of energy into in Melbourne. So thanks to Matilda and um, Aretti for coming and helping us out with that recently. Um, and students' lives and expectations are changing. So I just saw some figures on this actually. Since 2013, media access has gone from 15% mobile to 90% mobile. That's just in the last three or four years, that shift. So everything is mobile. Um, so organizations that are not up with that have a problem. Um, Hmm, okay, my five minutes has nearly gone now too, and I would like some questions and discussion. Um, so we, at the moment in Swinburne Design, we've got a, a Bachelor of Design, which is Communication, Digital Media, Branded Environments, Photo Media and UX Interaction Design. We've got a very sort of creme de la creme four-year communication course, which is where everybody gets um, involved in going out into industry and does a professional semester. Um, we've got some combined degrees, um, industrial design and um, product design engineering, um, interior architecture and 
we are just starting architecture, architectural engineering, and then we'll be doing a postgrad in urban design. So we're very sort of keen to play with EAC in this endeavor. We've got something called the Design Factory, which some of you may know was started in Alto University in Finland. Um, it's now a, a 25 uh, node network across the world, and Simbin was the third um, node there. That's, that's another idea for bringing a lot of different disciplines together, always with an industry partner, um, around a big sort of innovative challenge. And there are all sorts of things from very speculative products um, to fintechs and, and very diverse groups of people. So that involves working with Stanford, with CERN. Um, this is a pro this is a project um, that you would think that was a group of architects. It's actually a group of digital media designers, but Damon from from uh, Grimshaw there is t is talking. He is an architect. He's talking to them about this new space um, and um, the fact that it has this huge blank eight meter by seven meter wall and how that might become a site for digital storytelling in the city. This is a very nice site for them to work on because it's, um, it's this is the space. It's right at the back of this building, which some people might know. It's uh, completed about 10 years ago, Southern Cross Station. Um, and so about 30 to 50,000 people a day will walk past the screen from the new Docklands area coming back into the main station. Um, so the theorist Greg Ulmer has talked about the age of electricity. So we've sort of done literacy. literacy the word got very, very powerful for a while, sort of post-printing press, universal education. And um, that now we're back to, um, uh, to Instagram and Snapchat and, um, and a very, very visual medium of communication. So I think that's actually a, a huge opportunity for visual designers and spatial designers, um, but it's something sort of to, to think about and to grasp um, what, what that opportunity means. So I think I'll probably just wrap it up there, but I'll just um, try and play some of these videos. I think what I'll do, maybe I can maybe I can play some videos silently, and we can have some questions with the video playing behind. So the first one I'm going to play is a show reel. Um, but it's just got some very short clips from student work um, for their videos. For their, what will actually be five-minute urban stories, data-driven generative content um, that will go on this huge um, screen in the city. So let's just... There we are, the sound is on, but very, very quietly. So I think, in order not to be a rude guest, I should probably wind it up there. Thank you very much for listening so patiently. So thank you very much, Jane. I guess uh, we should open up for questions now, since you said you'd like a discussion. Does anybody have any questions? Um, it's going to be a very simple question, Jane. Um, I run here a studio, which is, um, amongst others, which is called Active Public Space, where we work with um, sensors in the public space, and we try to get these sensors to capture or to measure the space around us, including the users, um, and try to, inc to, um, to embed this information back into, um, into design. So I think there's a lot of uh, connection to the work that you've shown on the screen. So my question is, on Wednesday, we're having our jury, and I was wondering whether you would want to join. <laughs> From 10 to 6. All day. But you can come half day also. Hi, Jane. Th thanks. Thanks for your talk. This was a lot of work. 
and I'm struggling a little bit to figure out what to take away from everything. Um, I feel like I felt kind of a thread in the beginning where you were talking about struggles of how to use technology and parametricism and stuff like this to place make, to make place, to make things specific. You know, you were in your airport and you didn't know where you were, that could be anywhere. So. I was one. I think that is a thread that maybe you have some thoughts on. This is just a feeling. Do you think you could talk about how projects like any of these that you've spoken about, you have applied certain, you've combined a methodology, parametricism and and uh, programming and stuff like and mathematics and stuff like that, in order to make a place. Sorry, is that working? Yeah. I think that's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, Mark would love to talk about this one because he's just embarking on a project which is looking specifically at how parametrics can be used for placemaking. Um, but I think everything we do is about, is about placemaking. It's definitely about our place in the world. And our place in the world at the end, it does go back to the fact that we are a, a sensory organism that lives in that. And I guess that was my air condition theme, that I, I get very um, concerned that we're in a sort of... Uh, and I mean, this is a great space to be in. It, you know, you feel very present in this space. But there's a lot of other very grand spaces in the world where you don't feel terribly present because we've sort of got carried away in the ubiquitous drive to be at 21 degrees and to be at 30% relative humidity, to, um, to move people in a certain way through space, uh, to maximize the use of space in a way these very deep spaces where we're no longer in contact with any kind of natural environment. And um, so I think when we, so some of the research that I showed kind of briefly where we're looking for instance at the dynamics of air and taking that back to the physiology of the person, I think that's entirely to do with a sense of place, a sense of your own place in the world and of, of sort of taking it back to the human because that's where place comes from and trying to sort of map what that experience is um, rather than just uh, endlessly building, which is a very sort of powerful instinct that we we have and, and which we're very productive in many parts of the world. Um, maybe not so much here because the city isn't growing so fast, but certainly when you go to Asia and in Melbourne, I mean, we, we're at four and a half million and we're expecting to be at eight million before 2050. Uh, it took a long time to get to four and a half million and it's not going to take very long if they're right to get to eight million. Um, so there is a sort of frenetic ant-like kind of productivity around um, simply building and making more space, um, space rather than place. So if, if we can keep the conversation around place, I think that would be wonderful. Hey Jane, again, thank you for the lovely talk, but uh, I wanted to ask, like when you were talking about the subconscious of the human being, when he was, when you were saying like, uh, if we have a height, we are subconsciously talking louder or like, uh, and we, when we are small in smaller places, we're talking easier, but uh, I was thinking directly to the aspects of when we enter a church, it's subconsciously also, also uh, we speak, lower so it's kind of this parallelism that i was also thinking about and i would like some clarifications about this as well mm -hmm. and uh, another question uh, i it's also it's actually inspired from his question so is there any solution that could be site specific not just parameterized in a way that it could be applied in several places like is there any recipe for each place to be unique in his own way like maybe people like to be loud in that place or just this example so people like to be loud you're saying no, I, oh. I'm, I'm saying is there 
site-specific answers, not just uh, mm -hmm. an algorithm or yeah. something that could be repeated yeah. based on scientific facts. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, it's not so much around small spaces or large spaces. It's more that if we see that the sound can leak out of the space that we're in, um, then we compensate for that with vocal effort. Um, so it's very much around the configuration of the space. And I agree with you, yes, it's very nice if it's site-specific. And we, I mean, I guess with the pod, we tried to be quite site-specific and, and make something, you know, something that, that really highlights the difference between architecture and products, because I think we like to be very site-specific in, in architecture. And when you're a product designer, it's quite the opposite of that. You're driven by a market. And you know at the end, it doesn't matter how much iteration, how much variation you do, you're probably going to end up with three versions of the product, the expensive one, the cheap one, and the one that most people will buy or use. Um, so one of the questions around this pod, um, which you've sort of unwittingly raised, I think, is, is it architecture or is it a product? Because it's trying to address something which is very general in the market, which is a lot of great unhappiness about working in very open work environments when you like to get things done and you don't want to wear headphones all the time or be disturbed all the time. And you know, to be able to, let's not say, have enclosed spaces and open spaces, but to be able to have highly differentiated spaces that perform differently acoustically, visually, and are, are sort of their own magnet for different types of human behavior and, and um, ways of being in space. Um, so I guess we've been thinking about these pods in a very architectural way. One of our partners on that project is actually a manufacturer and a, a furniture and interiors designer. So they're much more interested in its potential as a product system, or as a product system at least. Um, so I, I actually, I don't have an answer to this, but I have found that kind of dichotomy between the design of products and the design of architecture, something that's really, really I found very stimulating to think about. Thank you very much, Jane, for uh, this inspiring talk. Um, I think we really like well align in um, commonly with uh, Yak uh, about this vision of interdisciplinary and how to connect with industry, academics, um, also about studios, how we can touch so many ground at the same time. Um, and I would I would like to hear from your insights how you succeed such um, um, how to say a bridge between so many disciplines at the same time that so many uh, collaborators and in industries. Uh, when we look at your presentation, it looks quite simple, but by experience it's not. Um, could you give us some insight on how mm -hmm. to reach better interdisciplinary uh, systems? Well, I, I, I hesitate to give you advice on this because I think <laughs> something you know all about. But um, uh, I guess one of the underpinning things is need. That's one. That's actually one of the reasons why I went to look at aerodynamics because we just thought it's really critical to the way you experience buildings and um, design. But it's something that we can only really tackle very superficially if we just um, if we just look at it from the point of view of a designer and we look at it with the kind of software and the kind of tools that we have as a designer. So we really, you know, it's just absolutely necessary that we have to work with aerospace engineers and with, and similarly with the sound. We've had to work with acoustic engineers there and they think about things very differently so there's some really useful friction there. So they're very interested in anything which can be measured uh, according to the existing acoustic measures which are many and various since the 1980s. There's quite a lot. So that's kind of enough. That's sufficient if you're an acoustic engineer. But to us we will say, yes, yes, you're right, you've measured it very well and you've counted it very well, but we still hear a difference. So, you know, so we're still very interested in what we, what we hear. So, um, 
but but we nevertheless we couldn't do that research without the input you know again they were very necessary to that process we wouldn't have the expertise to do what's been done in that project without the input that we've had so i think it's um it's uh, it's sort of thinking of projects where it's, it's really a necessary, not just a sufficient relationship between the disciplines. I mean, um, the aerospace engineers, we got involved just because we wanted to use a wind tunnel. So we had to go knock on the door and say, well, you've got a big wind tunnel. And they said, yes, but we get $7,000 a day for, you, you know, for giving that to the automotive companies. You know, what are you going to give us? Oh, well, you know, it's kind of just interesting research would you play with us and amazingly they did you know so you've got to hit the right people as well I think <laughs> okay um, which are the two or three main technologies that you think that they will radically influence design and uh, disruptively change the way that we do architecture and that designers mm. should start to take into consideration in their education of course mm. um, mm, tools I don't know I mean I mm, I do think that um, you know this is the big debate at the moment what is AI and machine learning going to do now that we theoretically at least have some data to work with and so what I mentioned the other day seeing this sort of pretty much bordering AI application to multi-residential plan planning of buildings uh, made me think potentially it could have a really big impact and um, it'll be interesting where it has that impact because not necessarily in our sphere of influence because we don't necessarily have have the big data and we don't necessarily have access to all of that either but uh, you know so organizations that do are going to be very motivated to and also have the resources to do that are going to be very motivated to build tools so one um, one company that we've also sort of seen this from this year was WeWork, which is a very big co-working uh, uh, company. Um, at the time that Daniel Davis was talking to us about it, they had 140 buildings, but I think they have a lot more now. So they're drawing their data from their users and clients in, let's say, for the sake of argument, 300 buildings around the, the world. So even if it's very simple data that's just coming from people answering those questionnaires, did you like the space? What did you not like about the space? Was the sound okay? You know, when you get a lot, a lot of that data and you start to look at machine learning algorithms to feed back into the way that you um, design and organize those spaces, um, that could be that could be very significant. But whether that's a, whether that's for good or for ill, I think you're asking me more from a creative point of view, from tools that we can that that we have access to that we can use in creative ways. So it's almost as though the discussion has to go on in a different forum somewhere else, and again, sort of has to move outside our immediate sphere. Um, and um, I mean, you were in, in Melbourne, and Matilda was in Melbourne, and we had a number of public events in something called M Pavilion, which is kind of Melbourne's answer to the Serpentine Gallery, down opposite the National Gallery Victoria. And um, you know, th the idea of those discussions was that they should be much more general. I did have some slides at the end I could have put up, but um, they were robots, the jobs for the future, or the responsive city, or to try and engage in a wider discussion. And some of the people on those panels were ex-politicians or people involved in very large um, kind of civic uh, urban concerns. So I think, um, yeah, so part of this is actually getting the discussion out there and saying, you know, w what sort of world do we want? What do we want design to do for us? Um, and we, we can't, um, we, we don't have the luxury of ignoring that part of the puzzle, I think. And how can we make the good things happen? Exactly. How can we make the good things happen? Yeah, because 
all the all the statistics, certainly in Australia, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same here, say that um, the um, the multiplication of technology is. Um, the benefits are all going to capital. They're going in a very disproportionate way to capital rather than labor. So that in itself is a, is a discussion that that has to be pursued. And, you know, in our world, I think that applies to us too, that, you know, there's such amazing possibilities and design is such a, a powerful force, but only if it can actually sort of play out in the public sphere in the way that we want it to. I guess we'll let your voice rest now. Um, if everyone would like to thank Jane once again, thank you so much for the lovely. Thank you very much.